Good afternoon, I am Modern Warfare Historia and boy oh boy, today we are going to be controversial. I have seen a fair amount of time people talking bad, if not even insulting, Italian tanks. I get it, it is quite funny to think at the Italian army as if it was a meme. However, I would like to bring to the table of discussion an idea that Italian tanks were not actually bad. I mean, if we take just statistics, yes, those were kind of bad, but numbers without context are almost always misleading. In fact, the Italian tanks were made like they did in order to solve specific problems and address specific requirements. And in today's video, the first of the Let's Talk About series, we are going to address that. Why did the Italian tanks were like that and were they actually that bad as it is usually portrayed? And yes, I do know that I will talk for a lot of time, so sit down, grab some food and something to drink and get ready for today's episode of me rambling through something not asked by anyone. This is the history of the Italian tank industry. The idea of an armored fighting vehicle was not something that the Italians were unaware of. In fact, the first experience of Italy with armor happened around 1912, during the Italo-Turkish War. That was fought in the Ottoman Tripolitania, that's basically modern Libya, and the Italians were also one of the first nations, if not the first one, to use armored cars in combat. After the Italians had landed in Libya, the fighting quickly turned into trench warfare, so the Italians needed to adapt and find solutions to win the campaign, and one of these was to use armored cars, the Fiat 15 bis, Automitragliatrice Colazzata, also called Amico, Armored Auto Machine Gun, the Fiat Arsenale, Fiat Arsenal, and Fiat Tipo 2, Fiat Type 2, and the Isotta Faschini RM Model 1911. By the way, I don't know if it was done on purpose, but in Italian the word amico stands for friend. The Italians also used the Siemt motorcycle and they started using radio telegraphs on a large scale, also thanks to the help of Guglielmo Arconi himself. Quick side note, we also see in this conflict the first use of a heavier than air vehicle for reconnaissance on the 23rd of October 1911, and on the 1st of November of the same year the aviator Giulio Gavotti was the first to drop bombs from an airplane when he threw 1.5 kilograms of bombs on Ein Zara and this was the first aerial bombing in history. Sadly for the Italians, the conquest of Libya costed something around 1.3 billion livres, way more than the planned and this damaged a lot the Italian economy and threw away a lot of resources. However, we can safely assume that the experience in the Italo-Turkish war was even slightly important for the Italian armor industry. However, the Italian doctrine was not on a war of movement with armored vehicles. The Italians were, for some years prior to 1914, seeing that on the horizon the risk of war was approaching, a war against the Austro-Hungarian Empire. To prepare for war, the Pizza Empire created a lot of defensive fortification with long-range artillery. This was also because almost all Italian land borders are with very high mountains. The only places where there are not that many mountains are near the coastline where there is also a river which is the Adriatic Sea and when you attack near the coastline you risk of coming under ship-based artillery. This means that the borders are a hard place to fight for the Italians when on the offensive, but may be somewhat easy to defend, especially when helped by the aforementioned fortification. By the way, something that may be interesting for you to watch is a video that I have planned on one of these forts that I had the fortune to visit last year when I was near that part of the world, and while there I also bought the book Forte do Saccio di Yoga by Leonardo Malatesta that I'm using right now as a source for this part of the video, and for a future video on... no, I'm not going to spoil this one, if you want to know more, subscribe and turn on the notification bell to be informed on when we do upload videos. And yes, this book can also be found on our website. The idea of the Italian army was to start on a defensive, using the mountainous terrain and the fortification to stop any Austro-Hungarian offensive, use a mobile reserve in case it was needed and build up forces for a major offensive. The idea of a mobile reserve was already around since 1899 and it was proposed by General Tanker di Saletta to the Commissione Suprema per la Difesa di Stato Supreme Commission for the Defense of the State, and this was deemed the most cost-effective solution. I know that in the specific case the general was not talking about the border with Austria Hungary, but rather the zone of the country between the Como Lake and the Maggiore Lake, in case a war with Switzerland broke out. Still, from what I can understand, the idea of a mobile reserve was useful on all the borders of Italy. Therefore, I guess that those mobile reserves were created and sometimes even used. And yes, even though Switzerland was less of a threat, 
rather than France or Austria Hungary, the chocolate country was still being under observation since 1895 and the preparations were being made in form of artillery fortification. This was because there were some tensions between Italy and Switzerland, like the Affari Silvestrelli, the Silvestrelli Affair, for example. And yes, I will spend a lot of time on the First World War, as it heavily influenced the Italian doctrine in the interwar period and in the Second World War. If we take a look at a possible Italy versus France scenario, France would have a big superiority in all aspects from the fact that the French had a bigger army to the fact that its army was organized better. The only aspect in which Italy had a small advantage was that the Italian had a bigger mobile force, but this only at mobilization completed. It was also noted that the border could be held by light troops like the Alpini, the Bersaglieri and the Mountain Artillery, while the other standard troop could be mobilized. In case the light troops screen was not enough, those could be supplemented by reinforcement. Also, the fortification would be useful to slow down the enemy advance and give Italy enough time for the mobilization of the army. The same thing was noted on the northeastern front, on the austro hungarian border, the nation that was most deemed as a threat after, in 1904, the relations between France and Italy became better, while the ones with the dual monarchy were becoming slightly worse. It was also noted that the logistical side on the austro hungarian border was very, very bad, and this was a major problem for Italy. To give you a number, in 1903 it was calculated that in order to mobilize the army, because of the underdeveloped rail system, it would take around 26 days. The general idea here was again at first to defend the border and then go on defensive with something around 150,000 troops. It should also be noted that the defense of the Italian border would not be an easy task. In fact, if the enemy would advance in the regions of Friuli and Veneto, they would do that on a plain terrain. It comes to no surprise, in fact, that the Austrian game plan, created in 1877, was to advance at first toward the Isonzo River, regroup and then advance quickly towards the Adige River, before engaging in a decisive battle, without the fear of having troops on the mountain's flank. There will be sounds more offensive on the mountain, but those will be to simply tie down Italian forces there. Following plans modified the river but had the same concept in mind. Italy, on the other hand, if it went on the offensive, would fight only in mountainous terrain, regardless of the fact that the war would be either against France or Austria Hungary, as both the borders on the northwest and the northeast of Italy had big mountain zones behind them. Only in the last months of 1914, General Cadorna, newly appointed chief of staff to the Italian army, started to look at the Austro Hungarian front in a serious offensive way and not only in in a defensive way. There were already plans for decades of a possible war against Austria and Germany, with also the need to pass through Switzerland. And if you look at the geography, we can understand that a similar advance would be in mountainous terrain or mountain roads. And yes, I know that I've just talked for a lot of minutes without even mentioning tanks. However, it is fundamental to understand the geographical situation of Italy and the side effects that the Alps had on the development of the Italian army in general, and also on its armed forces. We all know that on the 28th of June 1914, a very important austro hungarian person was assassinated and the First World War started after this breaking point in history. Italy would end up waiting to go to war until, on the 23rd of May 1915, it joined the fight, on the entire side. Some of you may think that the Italians betrayed the alliance with Germany and Austria Hungary after being kind of bribed by France to enter the war, but as far as I know, Italy respected the terms of the agreements with the Central Powers. However, take my words with a grain of salt as I have not looked up at the terms of the agreement. Anyways, the first two years of war were a nightmare for Italy. Already one month after the declaration of war, on the 23rd of June 1915, the first major offensive started. This was the first battle of the Isonzo. Not only this was an offensive, thus giving the attackers, in this case the Italians, a very bad time, but this was also literally an uphill, or I should say a mountain battle. The Italians were able to advance, but on the 7th of July, the offensive was halted after less than 10 kilometers after the Isonzo River, with most of the gains being made near the coastline. After two weeks, there was the second battle of the Isonzo, and then the third, with both of these offensives being inconclusive. The 4th Battle of the Zonzo and the 5th made the Italian army advance, but these were still inconclusive on the big picture. The Austrians started the Staff Expedition, Punitive Expedition, also called Battle of Asiago. The idea was to advance south from Tentino to reach the Adriatic Sea, thus encircling the Italian 2nd, 3rd and 4th Army. The Italians risked very badly, 
as their border was around 30 kilometers from the logistically important Vicenza, 60 kilometers from Padua, and around 80 kilometers from the Adriatic Sea. Also, it should be noted that from Vicenza southward, the terrain was plain or hilly, not with mountains, therefore the Italians needed to hold the line, and hold they did. Luckily for the Italians, the Russians also helped by launching the Brusilov offensive. They prompted Austria-Hungary to remove some troops and move them east. The Italians now could start again the offensive with the 6th Battle of the Zonso that managed to capture Gorizia, thus boosting Italian morale. Three more battles of the Isonzo were inconclusive and were basically useful in order to simply drain out Austrian government power of around 80,000 casualties, but suffering around 110,000 casualties in the process. The 10th Battle of the Isonzo was as bloody as the three previous combined, with more than 100,000 losses on both sides, and with the results of a limited Italian advance. The 11th Isonzo battle was slightly more successful geographically, but left the second army vulnerable. This vulnerability was exploited by the Austro-Hungarians and the newly arrived German reinforcement that, with the help of the stormtroop tactics and mine warfare, pierced the Italian defensive line and brought the front line 150 km towards the Italian plains and reduced the Italian army from a fighting force of 1,800,000 to around 1 million, but take this number with a grain of salt. This major defeat at Caporetto also had two important consequences, as the government of Paolo Boselli collapsed and General Cadorna was replaced by General Diaz. Oh, by the way, a certain Erwin Rommel won the Order of Merit pour le Merite during this battle. I guess this dude will become important later in this video. The Italians were able to stop the Austro-German advance on the Piave River in June 1918. There was no immediate Italian counter-offensive, as the Regio Esercito had been devastated. However, with the Austro-Hungarian Empire on the brink of collapse, on the 31st of October, the Italian army went on the offensive, the Vittorio Veneto offensive, and the dual monarchy front collapsed, and on the 3rd of November, Austria-Hungary asked for a truce, thus ending the Italian First World War experience. And yes, the first two years of war were a nightmare for Italy, but the third was hell itself. It is no wonder why the Italians were left traumatized, similar to the French, by this war. I mean, imagine fighting 11 identical offensive that cause hundreds of thousands of deaths and then your enemy on a single offensive drives you back 150 kilometers and nearly halves your fighting forces. But let's talk about armored vehicles now. And no, before you ask, I will not cover Leonardo da Vinci's tank, even though technically this was the first Italian tank and probably the first tank ever. We already saw that the Italians had armored cars and that those had been used in Libya. Those vehicles were not usable in the mountains, so those were not used that much in the conflict, except for, I guess, during the retreat from Caporetto to the Piave River and during the Vittorio Vent Offensive. There was also this thing, the Italia Fili Pavesi, Pavesi wire cutter, that was a tractor with metal plates on it, with the capability of cutting wires. It was not a good vehicle, mobility was very bad, the armor was not enough to stop rifle bullets in some cases, and after the vehicle did not impress the generals during a trial, it was ejected. The Pavesi company tried with another project, but a lack of interest because of other competing designs, brought the end to the life of the Italia Fili. If we want to talk about tanks, however, we need to start to talk about big metal beasts, not cars with metal plates. I will start at first with the most famous Italian design and then go on foreign tanks. The first Italian tank was the Fiat 2000, or as I like to call it, what the heck is this thing? I mean, I do understand the Italian love for fortifications, but seriously? This was a colossus of a vehicle, weighing around 40 tons. To put that into perspective, the various Mark series from the British were around 28 tons. This was basically a mobile pillbox, but it was a bad design, too much obese. It had a 65-17 gun in a turret and up to 8 6.5mm machine gun. The cannon was quite good as it was a mountain howitzer, so it was very light and compact. In the 1920s, the cannon was also given to the regular infantry that used that as a close support weapon and as an anti-tank gun. It was manned by a crew of eight and had quite a thick armor as most of it was made of 20mm steel plates. There was just a small problem with this tank. Yep, you guessed it, mountains. This beast was not the most nimble thing to drive around on a mountain road or even worse, probably a battlefield. By the way, if you're wondering on why the name has the number 2000, you are not the first one. I found on the website landship.info, on the page about the Fiat 2000, the following, the following, and I quote. 
By the Italians were quick to start experimenting with Vamo cars, the first Italian tank project proper was not begun until 1916, and was mainly the work of a certain Captain Luigi Casali. His idea was to build an armored machine capable of moving cross country, sporting two machine gun equipped turrets. Such a vehicle was actually built by the company Pavesi, who had experience in cross country vehicles. This project, the Fiat 1000, was abandoned after tests and proved the limits of that particular design vehicle. Now, from what I can understand, he is clearly talk about, talking about the Pavesi Work Cutter. However, I would like to understand if the Pavesi Work Cutter was actually the Fiat 1000. However, I have not yet been able to confirm this. Let's go back to the Fiat 2000. There was an order of at least two vehicles, judging by the weapon procurements, and these were produced before the end of the First World War, but did not saw combat. One of these was modified with two 37mm AT guns, and those were added instead of two machine guns. And yes, I would like to see this version in War Thunder as a counterpart to the German, Soviet and British behemoth at Tier 1. By the way, before I forget, there is a group in Italy that is working on the construction of a Fiat 2000 from basically, for what I understood, original drawings, in a one-to-one -one scale. You can find them on Facebook at Costruzione Replica Carro Armato Fiat 3000, if interested. They have been able to build it and it works. I really, really hope that they will make it visible in the future as, of course, I want to try it. I'm telling you because if you do have financial capabilities, please consider helping them in their effort as I do have a feeling that they plan on building more tanks. Also, the link of their YouTube channel is in the description. Let's go back to history now, after this small parenthesis. At least one of the two was sent into February 1919 in Libya to fight guerrilla forces but also to do a publicity stand as an advertisement for Fiat going around the Libyan roads with a huge Fiat logo painted on the front and in April of 1919 they performed in Rome in front of the king. Their service life in Libya was short and nothing interesting except for the advertisement. However, those were not sent alone, but rather as a part of the Batteria Autonoma Carri d'Assalto, autonomous battery of assault tanks, together with one Schneider CA1, number 212, and at least six Renault FT. It shall be noted, however, that some sources indicate four Renault FTs and some even two. Those French tanks had been purchased by Major Alfredo Bonicelli when he was sent during the Great War to France and Great Britain to study their solution and to acquire foreign tanks. Speaking of foreign tanks, the Italians used, as we just saw, both the Schneider CA1 and the Renault FT. The FT was the most liked one, mostly because of its lightness and its good usability in the mountainous part of Italy. The Italians liked the FT so much that they acquired the license of production and these tasks went to the Fiat company. This was also not to rely on French companies as the acquisition of the license happened during the war and as we already saw, the French companies were already busy producing for their own armies. Sadly, for the Italians, the tank did not arrive in time before the end of the war and the initial production order of 1400 fell to just 100 vehicles. The Fiat made some modification to the original design, you know, why not? And the final vehicle called Carlo d'Assalto Fiat 3000 Model 21 basically a Sol Tank Fiat 3000 model 1921, entered service in the year indicated in the name. One of the various modifications was that the armament was increased from a single machine gun to two machine gun placed in a binary position, and also the tank was quite fast, being able to reach 21 km per hour on road. As the dual machine guns were found inadequate, the armament was then changed again to a single 37mm gun in the Fiat 3000 model 1930, and 52 tanks were produced of this version, bringing the total number to 152 vehicles. At first, the idea was to produce another tank in order to carry the 37mm gun called Fiat 2000 Tipo 2, Fiat 2000 Type 2, that was slightly larger and had thicker armor, but it was cheaper to simply convert some of the original Model 21 into the Model 30. And yes, if you have noticed that I'm making a lot of cuts, is because I am having problems literally talking today, I have no idea why. But let's go back to tanks. The two used versions were then redesignated to L521 and L530 respectively, with the letter L standing for Leggero, light, and the number 5 standing for 5 tons, because as far as I know, it weighted 5.3 tons. The Fiat 3000 did so service as first in Libya in 1926 and then in Ethiopia in 1935. It also saw foreign interest and it was sold to Albania, Latvia, Hungary and Abyssinia. And for those who don't know that, Abyssinia and Ethiopia are the same country, so yes, the Italians sold, in the 1930s, a small batch of tanks to a nation that they later fought against half a decade later. 
Luckily for the Italians, the African Kingdom delivery consisted of only four vehicles, but I still find this funny. Apparently, the service in Libya was bad, as the tanks continued to have problems with sand. From what I found online, Italy sent a company of tanks to Libya, yet I do not know the exact number for it. Oh, and we should also add that the Fiat 3000 was also used during the Second World War in the Greek Albanian front and in 1943 against the Allied when they landed in Sicily. Two companies operated in Sicily, one being used as a fixed fortification, while the other as a mobile unit during the Battle of Gela. It comes to no surprise that few of these vehicles survived the war. Another vehicle used in Libya was the Fiat Terni Tripoli, an armored car armed with 6.5mm Fiat Ravelli 1914 machine gun. Nothing fancy, but we will see it again later. A small parenthesis on the Renault FT, Major Benicelli also modified one of the Giro turreted FTs and installed an artillery gun. Sources are not precise on what gun was installed, some say it was a 75mm and some say 105mm. If I had to choose, I would stick with the 105mm gun, as from photographic evidence it appears to be the 105 14 model 1917, and that would also explain why the vehicle was called Semovente 105 14. And yes, this was the first of the truck Semovente family of vehicles. The tank appeared in 1919 in front of the king in Rome in the same show in which the Fiat 2000 was present. As for what happened to the tank, it is unknown. Sadly, there is not enough information on the matter of the gun caliber, but I do believe that the 75mm was used just in a drawing, while the actual vehicle was built with the 105mm. And yes, I would say tracked as Italy actually had in 1915 with some 20s, even if they were not called like that. These were the 12235 SPA 9000 that was a truck converted to AA platform by installing a 12235 artillery gun on the back of the vehicle. Italy had been working for some time on installing, like France and Germany, 75mm guns on SPAAs, however the Italian Army and Command decided to change the gun. Luckily for them, the Ansaldo company had produced 90 guns of the 10235 model that were destined for the Navy destroyers, but because these ships were not ready, the company proposed to install 20 of these guns on the SPA 9000 chassis. Since this vehicle is very interesting and there is quite a lot of info on it, I will probably dedicate an entire episode on it in the future, so I will not go in details here. The only thing that is worth to consider is that these guns were sometimes used as mobile artillery. In total, 135 of these were produced, however, one of the main problems was the cost. There was around 2 million livres for a battery, composed of 4 SPAAs, and the command and supply vehicles, while the total budget of the Italian army in 1914, as far as I know, was 3 billion livres. Italy in the First World War had as an SPAA, also the autocannone da 7630RM. This was a Fiat 18 BLR truck with the addition of a modified 7640 model 1916. And yes, the original gun was the 7640, while the one added on the truck was the 7630. Therefore, we can assume that the modification was the shortening of the barrel. During the First World War, two batteries of four self propelled anti aircraft gun were created, and in the 1920s another battery was created, for a total of 14 self-propelled anti-aircraft guns. These two World War I batteries were named RM1 and RM2, however I have no idea what RM stands for these guns in this occasion. These were detached from the original vehicle and added on a more modern one, and so usage also in the Second World War as those were given to the Milizia Marittima d'Artilleria, basically maritime artillery militia. In 1942, the 14 guns were sent to Libya and comprised the 13th and 14th battery, comprised of 5 guns each, while the 16th battery had 4 guns. The 16th battery was attached to the 16th Infantry Division Pistoia and the 14th to the Infantry Division Sabrata. The 131st Tank Division Centauro received 6 guns, and some sources even state 7. Since the math does not make sense, as the only remaining battery, the 13th, had only 5 guns, I suppose that one or both of the other batteries were dismantled in order to free up enough guns. The last SPAA of the First World War that I want to talk about was the 7527 Model 1906. This gun was placed on concrete basement in order to transform them into high-angle AA guns. 
However, the ones that we do care about were the versions of these guns that were the 7527AV, with AV meaning anti-velivolo, anti-aircraft, were created with the idea of placing it also on the chassis of the Lancia IZ. However, the project fell through and I have no idea that indicates if any Lancia IZ were even modified. A slightly more successful version was the 7527CK, with CK meaning Commissione Coup, Coup Commission. The gun was created in order to install it on the Itala X truck or the Fiat 18BL. And yes, this truck was the same as the Fiat BLL, but the BLL was likely a reinforced version, hence the L in the name. At the end of the First World War, Italy had 72 of these guns on trucks and 93 either towed or in fixed installation, organizing six batteries. The 7527CK also saw service in the Spanish Civil War, installed on train flatbeds, and saw service in the Second World War, first as protection for logistical columns and then, from 1942 onward, was used as a static emplacement to defend the metropolitan territory and military installation. Now let's go back to vehicles meant to combat ground stuff, and we will return to SPAAs in a couple of decades. Sadly for the Italian tank designers, the country was broke, and there was not that much money to be spent on tank development. Honestly, the crisis was not only financial, but also social, as the post-war turmoil ended when a certain Benito Mussolini rose to power in the early 1920s. But before talking about politics, let's talk about a little at first the industrial situation and then the doctrinal one for Italy just after the First World War. Even if Italy did not suffer the amount of damage that, for example, France or Belgium suffered, nor it suffered a civil war like the now ex-Russian Empire, Italy was still in ruins. The Caporetto battle and the retreat towards the Piave River crippled the northeastern part of the nation. And since the most of the industries were in the north, it surely did not help the Italian economy. Also, while being a winner in the war, Italy went away from the Versailles negotiation, basically empty-handed, and this would later help in create the Vittoria Mutilata, the mutilated victory idea, that Italy was tricked into the war by the Anglo-French, with the exclusion of receiving territories that were then assigned to the newly bought Yugoslavian Kingdom. Also, as all the other nations, Italy had problems with the demobilization and the reintegration of ex-soldiers in civilian life. The war was a social disaster for the people, with one of the few good things being that the various parts of the nation were made closer by living in the trenches together, and this helped the creation of the so-called Italian spirit. It comes no surprise that the Italian generals and politicians were seeking better, less costly, both in terms of manpower and money, way to defend the borders. The solution for this was to give more weight to the fortress by making them more important. You already know that, by looking at how much time I spent talking about mountains and fortification, I am already preparing a video on those, right? The tank was deemed interesting, but still the main idea was that tanks could be easily stopped by literally blocking the mountain roads leading to Italy with metal objects or big rocks. If that failed, the artillery would do the job. Also, in the afterwar period, there was the idea that tanks were just an offensive tool in order to punch the line with infantry, probably on horses, following them behind. This idea will then evolve in the need for a heavy tank to break the line, medium tank, light ones and tankettes to cover the flanks of the breakthrough forces and counter any infantry counterattack, with the artillery harassing the enemy and the infantry assaulting and mopping up enemy resistance. But this will be analyzed later. Basically, the artillery fixes the enemy in place, the tanks break the line and the infantry follows and finishes the job. If enemy tanks appear, the artillery will be unleashed on them. Since the border was in the mountains, this idea was not bad because very probably the enemy vehicles would be very light. In case the field artillery wasn't available, it was supposed that the infantry had some small caliber infantry guns capable of dealing with the enemy armor. At first in the form of mountain artillery and then, as time moved on, in form of proper anti-tank guns. There was also the possibility to have the anti-tank artillery being towed by the light tanks, and there was also the idea of the Semovente type of vehicles that was the idea to literally install a big gun on a chassis that was meant for lighter guns. So in short, Italy has the need for some light and fast tanks and some heavy vehicles to punch a line, basically that have the primary objective to destroy the infantry. The obvious choice is to start dealing with the light tanks necessity first, also because Italy had also the need to control a quite vast empire with colonies in Libya and Somalia. 
From 1923 to 1932, Italy was involved in the Second italo Senussi War, also called the Pacification of Libya. This could be described as a sort of anti-insurgent style of war, and the Italians used tanks and armored cars to fight the Senussi rebels. These vehicles provided more as a moral weapon, however, rather than a real addition to the army. It is true that these machines participated in some battles, like the Battle for Kufa. However, poor reliability was found not only in the Fiat 2000, as we saw before in 1919, but also in the Fiat 3000, as it was found inadequate as far as reliability and speed go. At the same time, the Fiat Terni armor cars, together with the Lancia IZ and Fiat lorries with machine guns, were used in the 3rd and 4th Battalion, called Hunters of Africa. Some say these were the 4th and 5th Squadron. And as far as I know, the Fiat Terni was a very reliable machine, probably thanks to the Fiat 15 truck chassis on which the armor car was based on. These armor cars units were used in the occupation of the Oasis of Jarabub and the Oasis of Kufa. The Fiat Terni was also used as a scout car and, as far as I understood, also to coordinate with air reconnaissance. As you may understand, the campaign in Libya against the Senussi rebels was a heavy burden on the Italian industry and resources were already scarce. Italy had a chronic lack of resources, especially oil, coal and iron, and Italian policies of autarky did not help the situation, at least on the short term. This low amount of natural resources meant that the country was very limited in terms of industrial output, and at the same time that it needed a lot of imports. The idea of autarky was basically that the nation should stop importing and start produce all she needs for herself. What was unavailable on the Italian soil should be searched elsewhere, either by producing it synthetically or by conquering lands that had those materials, as it should be also acknowledged that not all resources can be synthesized. Some, however, can, like oil, and Italy had a huge need for oil. Considering that the technology at the time did not permit to fulfill all oil requirements by simply synthetic resources, and the African territories under Italy control had no oil, the country was in a big, big problem. Italy was extracting, as far as I know, some oil from its own territory, Obviously not enough to fulfill internal demand and I'm unaware if there were any plants producing synthetic oils. And yes, Italy was unaware that under the Libyan desert there was a huge quantity of oil ready to be discovered. These necessities for expansion will later be one of the many reasons why Italy invaded the Kingdom of Ethiopia. But let's not go ahead of ourselves. Another problem that Italy had at this time was education. Because the system was objectively bad, I will not go into the details of this video, it gave the nation a lower research and development standard compared to the rest of Europe. It should also be noted that sometimes some good ideas were rejected because they were too much a gamble, and if you know the Italian mentality, you know that it basically is something like, it was always like this, so it will always be like this. To be fair, Italy was not the only nation with this mentality. In the 1920s, the Italian duo of Guido Corni and Captain Cognamiglio developed this monstrosity that I do not have the courage to analyze the colony half -tuck. Let's return to Italian doctrine and vehicles, so let's skip for a few years. The year is now 1929 and there are two important events. The first one is the Wall Street crash that plunges the world into a session and blah 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 who cares about the big sad. The important thing is that Italy buys new tanks. But these are not any type of random tanks, but rather the Carden Lloyd tankette. Italy needed a tank design for more than half a decade now, and the choice fell on a foreign design, because of the very limited economic resources the nation had, and with the idea that if it worked, we may have it for cheaper instead of designing a vehicle ourselves that might not work at all. This very small vehicle would later become one of the most important in the Italian tank industry, as basically almost all vehicles from 1929 to 1945 would be somewhat related to this tankette. Italy purchased 25 Carden Lloyds, 21 arrived completed and 4 were assembled in Italy. Later in 1934 Italy would purchase the license for the production of an additional 100 vehicles, but is this irrelevant now? The tankette was armored enough to stop rifle bullets when they had very low velocity, had a crew of 2 and was armed with a machine gun either a British Vickers or an Italian 6.5 Fiat 1914, with apparently more than 3,000 rounds of ammunition. If this vehicle does not seem much to you, it's because it is not. It's not the most armored or harmed, however, it suits perfectly in what the Italian armored forces were looking for. It was light, small, fast and cheap to produce. Apparently, the British paid around £400 for every vehicle. 
I guess that translated to around 31,000 of today's euro and about 37,000 US dollars. This vehicle was therefore perfect for various roles. Roll number one, to be a mobile reserve in case the enemy broke through the line, thanks to its speed of around 40 km per hour. It may not seem a lot, but it was almost as double as fast as the Fiat 3000, that in itself was way faster than, for example, the Renault FD or the medium Mark A Whippet for World War I. It was not as fast as an armor car, like the Lancia IZ on road, but it offered good cross-country capabilities, with the only problem that, because of the suspension design, driving it basically made you seasick, and was an unpleasant experience, especially if you had the need to fight an enemy after a 20 minute ride, for example. Can you imagine having to choose between puking in the vehicle and making your commander pissed, or doing it on the outside, but risking being killed? Oh, and let's not talk about the fact that if you made very hard turns, the trike might fall off. Oh, and don't forget that it did not have an all-around armor, and there were big openings near the crew in order to give enough visibility to the driver and the gunner, so you risk having lucky enemy shot entering the hull right in your skull. Anyways, rule number two, to be a breakthrough tanks in case of attack against mountain lines, together with cavalry and bersaglieri that were fast and light elite infantry. In 1929, for example, Italy still had as reserves, cavalry, and like in the Piano 5L, Plan 5L, the idea was that if the French attack to Switzerland, some of the reserves would be militias on bicycles. And I do believe that these units would be Blackshaw militias. And no, we break through in this case, I do not mean frontline first attack, but rather as an exploiter of a gap in the enemy line or for flanking maneuvers. Rule number three, colonial service. The italo sinistri conflict made it clear that Italy needed some fast vehicles capable of dealing against enemy infantry and bandits, so having just a machine gun and very thin armor was not a problem. The tanket was also very light, and this meant less stress on the mechanical parts of the vehicle and less fuel consumption. The mobility was not only tactical, however, because of the very small size and the very light weight, around 1.7 ton, it could be carried around easily on a train, for example, on a truck or on a ship, with no problems. This thing could also be ideal in case Italy needed a quick reaction force in Libya, in Eritrea or in Somalia, for example. Also, it meant that it was kinda easy to recover it in case it got stuck, for example, in the mud. In the meantime, the Italians were developing a sort of dual fight mentality. Basically, if there was a war on the continent, the war would be static because of the mountains and little mobile forces would plug the line. If the war was not on Italy's soil, mobile units with light tanks and tankettes would be the way to go, also to not place a heavy burden on logistics. The idea sounds good, not great, but still good, in theory, considering what the other nations are doing at the moment, both in terms of doctrine and in terms of vehicle. Now, all that is needed are, well, the vehicles themselves. Obviously, Italy could not do too much with just 25 CV-29. They can either produce more or develop their own vehicle. As I said before, this tanket was the base on which a lot of later armor fighting vehicles would be made. Therefore, we already know that the Italians decided to develop their own vehicle from the CV-29 chassis. The next tanket that we see from Italy was the 1930 Ansalto light tank prototype. This vehicle was developed from the CV-29 and had some modification. The hull was longer and it was heavier, but this was not a problem as the mobility was similar, at least in terms of speed, thanks to a new, more powerful engine. This, however, is an assumption based on the fact that speed was the same, but the vehicle almost doubled in weight. The shape of the tankette was changed quite a bit, and we now have a full enclosed design, not like the CV-29, that made the crew vulnerable to enemy infantry and artillery splinters. The design still had a single 6.5 Fiat 1914 water-cooled machine gun, but again this was still enough as its role was to support the infantry. Only one prototype was built of this as the Ansaldo company already figured out that there was a big problem with the 1930 design, the suspension. While apparently it was slightly better than the one of the CB29, it was still not enough. We now jump to the 1931 prototype that fixes the problem with the suspension, introducing a 2112 suspension instead of the earlier 222 system. By the way, quick shout out to Tanks Encyclopedia. If you are interested in tanks on the website and YouTube channel, you will find a lot of interesting content. The 1931 prototype was almost identical in all the other aspects. It had a curve 2, a single 6.5 machine gun, and was very small and light, thus making it suitable for transport and mountain warfare. And considering 
what other nations were fielding in terms of light tanks, tankettes and scout vehicles, this was on par with foreign vehicles. Yes, other nations had heavier design, but the idea was still that your artillery, not your tanks, should fight the enemy tanks as your vehicles have other jobs to do. There was also another small vehicle called an Saldo light tractor prototype. I have no sources that confirm that this vehicle derived from the 1921 prototype or if it was the other way around. This small vehicle was created in order to tow artillery guns, had no armament and had an open top as this was not a frontline vehicle. In 1932, the Ansaldo created another vehicle, this time not a tankette but rather a semovente, called the Ansaldo da 9 tonnellate, basically Ansaldo 9 ton. This vehicle had been in development since 1929, had a curve 2, even in some sources state 3, and was armed with a 6.5 machine gun and, as far as the cannon go, 16517 model 1908-1913, the same found on the Fiat 2000. Sadly, there are not a lot of information on the matter, so I am not able to go in depth on the vehicle. Apparently, judging by the pictures found online, it could have had armor around 10 to 20 mm to the side, while front armor is unknown, but probably around 30 mm. However, a Russian website states that the front armor was around 16 mm thick. It is plausible, considering the standard armor of vehicles in these years was less than 40 mm. In 1933, the design was changed slightly and the year after it was sent to the Cento Studi della Motorizzazione, Motorization Center for Studies, also called CSM, but it was found to be too slow with just 22.5 km per hour of speed. Its range was around 100 km and this was actually not bad if you consider the year that we are talking about, however it was not deemed enough. Ansaldo started modifying it, but then the company priorities, and of the nation as well, were changing and the development was killed by another project that we will see later. This tank was in my opinion interesting and if it was continued it may have the chance to prove its qualities, but only if the engine would have been changed. For its time it could have been compared to the early Stux with the short baller 75mm gun, as the Italian tank would have been useful in the role of infantry support because of its large gun. The problem would have then been able to modify it to carry a bigger gun, as the crew compartment was small and therefore operating a large recoil gun would have been difficult. However, I do believe that, with improvements in the engine design, that could have made shorter the engine bay, while making the crew compartment longer and thus giving more space also to give to the possibility to add a loader for the gun, and with this the commander gunner could have concentrated only in finding the enemy and firing the gun, without having also to worry about loading it. Obviously, this would have been needed if my assumption of a two-man crew is correct. If the crew was already made of three tankers, the addition of another member was unnecessary, while the necessity for an additional space for the recoil mechanism in order to install a bigger and longer gun would still have been there. Let's return for a second to our favorite crazy design company, Pavisi. From 1924 to 1930, they developed four armored cars. All of these four were based on the P4 tractor, that was a quite successful vehicle that had just the major flaw of being too expensive, as it costed around 45,000 liras, that are basically around 40,000 nowadays euro, while other options costed around half of that, so the P4 was not very common with small and medium farmers. However, it saw quite a good history with the military, being primarily used as an artillery tractor. The four Pavese armor cars were, in random order, the Pavese 30 PS that had a Renault FT turret armed with machine gun and it had a crew of two and the armor was up to 6mm thick. There was also the Pavese Anticaro that was made in 1925 that had a hull mounted 57mm gun, although the model of this gun is unknown to me. It had a crew of three and the armor was up to 16mm. There was the Pavese 35PS that was similar to the 30PS but had a larger tower that also had a small cupola for the commander. I guess it had a two-man crew and armor up to probably 6mm like the 30PS model. What is interesting to note is that both the 30PS and the 35PS were apparently able to cross trenches up to 1.4 meters wide thanks to the very big wheels. Last but not least, the Pavese company also developed the Pavese L140 that resembles the 35PS, just a little bigger and with an additional machine gun. There was also another interesting vehicle, the Ansaldo model 1929, also simply called Fiat Ansaldo, 
that had a 360 degrees rotating turret with a 37 mm on the front of the turret and on the back a 6.5 mm machine gun. This vehicle had a crew of three. None of these models saw mass production and I do believe that there is a very limited amount of pictures out there simply because only one prototype was made but this is my speculation. We now jump to 1933 and we see one of the most famous Italian tank design of the interwar period, the Carro Veloci 33, Fast Tank 33. Yes, technically it was a tankette but whatever. This tankette was created in two series, Serie 1 and Serie 2. The main difference was that the Serie 2 was slightly more armored and featured a twin 8mm machine gun instead of a single 6.5mm used on the Serie 1. This vehicle was not very different from the 1931 Ansaldo prototype, as it can be easily seen even by just looking at them, and a not trained eye will not spot the differences in the suspension and in the machine gun mantlet. It had a crew of two, those being the driver and the machine gunner, and they were protected to the front by armor as thick as 40mm. This was enough to stop rifle bullets also because it, it was angled and technically could stop distant heavy machine gun fire, but this was still not enough if the enemy had modern anti-tank rifles like the British boys. The side and the rear of the vehicles were protected by around 8mm of armor, while the top was as thin as 7mm. This tankette became very quickly the workhorse of the Italian army with more than 1200 being produced. Obviously, not all of these produced were in a single version. In fact, Italy produced a lot of versions of this vehicle, such as L3 Zapatoi Diggers, that was apparently a bridge carrying vehicle, L3 Passerella Walkway, also called Carri Getta Ponte, basically bridge tower. It shall be noted that sometimes these two versions of the Zapatoi and the Passerella have been indicated as the same version of the L3. The bridge carried gave the possibility to cross ditches up to 7 meters long and with the maximum differences in height of 4 meters and the crew could do this even without having to get out of the vehicle and the bridge could be laid in as fast as 10 minutes. L3 Rampas Movente, self-propelled ramp, that was literally a moving bridge and this was developed in 1938 and just three were built of this version. L3 LF, that stands for Lanciafiamme, flame tower, and this was probably one of the very best versions of this vehicle as because of its very small size it was able to perform surprise attacks and literally transform the other tank in a barbecue. The flame tower was installed instead of the left machine gun and the fuel was contained in the small trailer. The experience in the Spanish Civil War then suggested to modify the design and have the flame tower tanks above the engine, I guess for mobility reason. This vehicle was very loved by the entire army and apparently all the L333 companies had one L3LF platoon in the organization. Probably this was also the most successful of the various version because with the flame tower you don't need to penetrate enemy armor, you just need to hit them up. And considering that a lot of Italian AT guns had a limited penetration potential, the status of the L3 comes to no surprise. L3 Cento Radio, that was the command version with a radio, and was recognizable by the big circular antenna behind the casemate. L3CC, Contro Carro, basically anti-tank, that was armed with a solo turn 20mm AT gun that in Italy was called Carabina S, Carabine S, or from 1942 onward, Fucil Anticarro S, anti-tank rifle S. This gun was not the best AT rifle in the world, but it was still better than nothing. The problem relied in the fact that it could only penetrate 18mm at 300m, and this made it suitable only to fight against armored cars and half stacks. The main problem of the CC version, other than the AT rifle being very limited in terms of penetration, was that the gunner would have to expose himself in order to operate the gun, if the gun was installed externally, while if the gun was installed internally, the swinging of it was problematic, due to the very limited amount of space available. Apparently, a lot of these CC versions saw service in the Ariete division in the Second World War. There was also the Carro Veloce Recupero, Fast Tank Recovery, that was an unarmored CV33 with towing equipment in the back of the vehicle. Some L3 33 Serie 2, Serie 2 were modified by soldier to carry, in addition of the twin machine gun, the Brixia Model 35, that was a 45mm light mortar. This weapon was very interesting as it was a magazine-fed, breech-loaded, trigger-fired mortar. 
The downside of this was that the munition, contained in 10 rounds magazine, had a very low explosive potential. On the bright side, the weapon was deemed very accurate, so being able to rain down accurate, albeit small, explosive round from your tankette at a range of 500 meters was not a bad idea. I do not have any confirmation in this, but I guess that these modified L3s were probably one of the first, if not the first ever, vehicle with the capability of having a sort of grenade launchers that was not single shot. There were five L3s that were converted to carry the 13.2 Breda heavy machine gun, and those were designated L3 Breda 31. Sadly, I have not enough information to understand if these were original L3 33s or L3 35s that we will see later. There were some L3s that were converted to carry the 12.7 Breda Safat heavy machine gun, but these, unlike the L3 Breda 31, were not factory conversion but rather soldier modification. And yes, this Breda Safat heavy machine gun was the same used by the Rage Aeronautica, and I'm not sure if I really want to know how they procured these MGs, as I have the feeling that they stole them from the Air Force. The CV-33 Addestamento Mitraglieri machine gun training was one vehicle that was converted to this sort of static simulator to train gunners. There was a fog dispenser version, apparently called Caro Veloce con Remorchio, that was able to tow a trailer that contained 240 liters of sulfuric acid that created a smoke screen for more than 15 minutes. These trailers could also be modified, apparently, to deploy mustard gas with some modification. A remote control explosive version, called L3 da Demolizione, Demolition L3, was created, but apparently it did not serve service. Some say that there were some converted to AA platforms with the installation of an 8mm machine gun on an AA mount, but I was unable to confirm or deny this. Last but not least, there was a turret 20mm, apparently, but only one was converted to this model, and this was made in 1937. Since the website I took this information is Hungarian, I may have done a translation wrong, However, I think that it is a possibility that one was modified, considering that in August 1937, the Spanish nationalists expressed the need for the installation of a 20mm gun on either the Panzer I or the L3 tankette. In the end, the modifications were done on the Panzer I because it had a turret, while some modified CV-35 called Trubia were made. My assumption is that this 20mm version might have been a possible answer to the proposal of the Panzer I, but the deal did not go through. In fact, my best guess is that this CV-33 20mm turreted tank was the Cavalry Combated Infanteria Tipo 1937, infantry fighting tank type 1937. Stating that this was a CV-33 is quite wrong, as it was very different from the Italian tankette. However, some components were cannibalized from the tankette and installed in this prototype, for example, the trucks. These were the versions fielded mainly for Italy or Italian Allied Nation. However, due to the very cheap design of the CV-33 that costed around 86,800 liras in 1935, that's equivalent to 100,000 of today's euro, the vehicle saw a lot of foreign interest. 36 of the Serie 2 were given to Austria, armed with a Schwarz Laws calibre 8mm in 1935. 14 were sold to Bulgaria in 1934-35, again armed with the Schwarz Laws machine gun. And by the way, it is interesting to note that when the war came, the L3 tankettes in Bulgarian service were used as ambulance and ammunition carriers, as well as obviously through training. Hungary received around 30 of the Serie 33 in 1934. Spain received around a dozen of CV-33 during the Spanish Civil War. Finding the exact number is hard as they have always been indicated as 155 CV-23 and CV-35 combined. Albania may have received some prior to the Italian occupation of the country. Venezuela apparently bought two CV-33s in 1935. However, some indicates that these were CV-35s. All in all, the CV-33 was exported quite a bit, even though its successor, the CV-35, would have a much better export life. The CV-33 has always created a sort of bad tail around itself, mostly because of the lack of a turret or of heavy AT weaponry, so let's take a look at the good and bad sides of the vehicle. Keep in mind that this will apply also to the CV-35, so I will not repeat this evaluation with that vehicle. As a good side, the tank was very cheap to produce, both in terms of material, work hours, and soldiers needed to crew the vehicle, too, in this case. 
Also, because they did not use a cannon, there was no need for materials usually needed for AP projectiles like tungsten. The vehicle was very small and light and this made it suitable for mountain operation because of the low center of gravity and low ground pressure. The twin machine guns were good against the infantry, especially for suppression fire. If the enemy lacks powerful and numerous AT weaponry, simple rifle fire, albeit not from very close, will not stop you. The very small size made it suitable for fast operational and strategic deployments. In fact, this tankette was so small that it could be even carried by a truck. The very low silhouette gave the possibility to use the tank as a good ambush vehicle. And for the bad sides, the dual machine guns were unable to destroy or even damage vehicles that had some armor. The visibility inside the tank was not good. The lack of a turret meant not only limited fighting capabilities, as the tankette would need to turn its entire body towards the enemy, but also it meant less crew awareness of what happened outside. Armor was poor, not only in material quality, but also in construction techniques. In order to make the armor panel interchangeable, in case those were damaged, the Italian designers used in the project bolted armor. It was not that the Italians did not know what welded armor was, it's that this was their choice. Sadly for the crew, the bolts, when hit, were a safety hazard, as various material pieces would fly in the inside of the tank. The inside was cramped and this made the problem of the earlier safety hazard even worse. Due to the position of the escape hatches, the crew had difficulties to escape from the vehicle if there was the need. Some sources indicated that this vehicle, in order to start the engine, would have required a crewman to go on the outside and turn a crank and this was obviously not ideal. While being very light was a good thing, it was reported that sometimes in mountain terrain in, in Ethiopia and Albania, it bogged down, especially if there was mud. My guess is that this was because of the very narrow tracks used. The lack of a radio also prevented efficient ways to communicate with other vehicles, but this was a common problem in the 1930s. At last, the L3 had a problem that a lot of variants were produced. This might seem a good thing to some, as those were based on the same chassis. And indeed, having commonality with other equipment is surely great from a logistical side. However, I do feel that this created in the Italian army mindset a sort of dependence on the L3 that hindered the development of more sophisticated models. Basically, the idea could have been, we have this vehicle, it is good enough, we don't have to improve. This was also the idea that the army got after the Ethiopian experience that we will see later. The idea of what we have is enough can also be traced in the low amount of tension in mainland Europe, generally and especially the ones that involve Italy. This was true up until 1934, but this changed when Ingebel Dorfus got assassinated and Italy mobilized its troops on the Australian borders ready to protect Austrian independence from a possible German aggression and going as far as replacing a statue in Bolzano by removing the one there and placing a statue of Roman general Nero Claudius Drusus Germanicus, a German of the Roman Empire that conquered part of Germany. And yes, when statues get changed, it means that the situation is quite serious. While this did not affect armor combat doctrines and design worldwide, it probably showed the world, and especially to Italy, that tensions were rising and that Italy needed tanks in case there was ever the need to fight another Piave River type of battle again, where forces would be needed to plug the gap, or in, in case that Italy decided to go on the offensive by crossing the mountains. In addition to this, there was also an idea starting to appear in Italian doctrine of three types of tanks, those being the Caro Veloce, the Caro d'Assalto and the Caro di Rotua, the Fast Tank, the Assault Tank and the Breakthrough Tank, respectively that we will take a look in a couple of years from now, probably after the chapter on the Spanish Civil War. As war is becoming more possible and tension arising, we have to ask ourselves, how is Italy going to prepare for war? Now I will take a small break, as probably my video editor software is going to kill itself due to the huge amount of stuff that is needed for this video. So I guess I will divide the whole conversation in two or three parts, so just wait for the rest. Thank you for watching, and remember to, oh wow, have I really talked this much? without even arriving to half of the script.